Now, I felt the pressure to get a big guest on first up for this season, and I think that I've got him. He's led Buller to a Heartland Championship. He's played in Russia. He's become a Tasman hero. He was a Hurricane star. He won Super Rugby with a drop goal for the Landers. He then went off to Italy with Treviso, came back to the Landers. Now he's making millions of yen in Japan. It is the great man himself, Marty Banks. Welcome, Banksy. Thanks for coming on. Jammer, I've, uh, I've avoided you for about a year. Um, didn't think I'd even end up on the show because there's uh, probably two people I would not trust on a phone call, and one's yourself and one's Joe Wheeler. And uh, I never thought I'd ever sit on a podcast with you, but here I am, right. man, mate. Hey, thanks for coming on, giving up your time. I know you're flat out at the moment over in Japan. Yeah, flat out watching Prison Break, but uh, got a day off, mate, so I'll make time for you. Yeah. How much Prison Break have you watched? Uh, your brother got me onto it, um, regretfully. Um, in the last week, I think I've banged out the whole the whole series. So, um, yeah, four four seasons, I think it was. I tip, tippy toed through the first season, and then uh, it got me hook, line, and sinker for the last four. So, um, happy to see the back end of it. End of it. Jeez, that's what like forty hours worth. Of... <laughs> no, no, we worked it out. It was sixty something hours, and uh, yeah, it's no. Nah, in the last sort of week and a half, it's. Uh, it's not, I don't know whether that's an achievement or if it's uh, stupidity, but um, I, like I said, I'm, I'm finished it today and I'm glad it's gone because I might get some sort of life back. <laughs> what sort of training? Are you guys not training at the moment? What's the situation in Japan? Um, no, we're training. Um, I normally pick my pick my uh, four hours up after training, six till ten, get in bed. I was just living out life on uh, on pretty much auto 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 repeat just day after day, but. Um, now nah, we're training, so Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday, Friday, Jabber. So uh, yeah, just chipping away. Long days though. Leave it, leave the door at six thirty. Um, get home at six. So um, tough at the cold face, mate, mate. So what about the cooking and stuff? How are you fitting time to cook? Um, probably don't really cook too much. Well, because on the on our training days we get given dinner. Um, so we, before we head home, we get a dinner. It's not massive. I don't eat all of it because. Uh, most of it's fish, so I try and avoid that. But uh, get home, park up, chuck an Uber Eats call in, and they drop off a wee, a wee snack. And uh, I'm not like you, mate. I don't have a missus over here or, or Toey. Toey comes home, and it's all prepared. So um, I slave away on a Wednesday. I'll cook on my days off, but uh, not too much during the week. Should I thought by now you would have been able to cook yourself a meal? I can cook myself a meal, Jabba. It's not anything spectacular, but, uh, yeah, I can hold my own. So you must be missing the girlfriend then? Yeah, I guess it's uh, pretty tough work doing your own cleaning and your own washing. But uh, no, nah, it is it is actually, you come home and like I said, that's where the old uh, prison break probably fills in my time because you come home and you're sort of home to an empty house. And um, so that side of it gets a bit tough. Um, spend a bit of time in Tojo's back pocket there with him and Beth playing the, the second child. So um, uh, they take me out, get me out of the house a little bit here and there. <laughs> And then what's the go with the Japanese comp over there? It seems like a pretty weird situation. Yeah, we're not really too sure. Um, they've postponed the first three weeks. Uh, yeah, like we've been doing pretty pro- uh, sorry, pretty well with our, our coronavirus. I think we've only had a couple of small cases, but uh, some of the top teams have been hit. Um, so I think whether it's been delayed completely because of that um, would probably be my guess. Uh, I think Kobe had a bit of... Bit of COVID there and Suntory, um, a couple of other teams as well. So when teams like that are probably the main the main teams in the comp here, I guess uh, the powers at will would probably want them guys playing. So the little teams like us that are COVID free get punished because uh, the other teams aren't doing so well with it. But the plan is to start on the 6th, um, 6th of February. Not too sure who we play. We either play Hino, who's our first game, or um, maybe Kobe, I think, who is scheduled to be our third. So Waiting for that to work itself out. Are we going to see the TJ Banks Marshall combo? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's been interesting the first uh, or the last bit of preseason anyway. When TJ gets here, so well since TJ's been here, it's been uh, Toei in the fifteen jersey and TJ at, at nine, and um, rest of the boys are Japanese qualified or Asian passport holders in the back line. So um, whether we'll see TJ and me and Tom, I'm, I'm not sure. I hope so at some stage, but. Uh, at the moment, it's predominantly South African Fords and and uh, Toei and TJ. So, so it is though. But um, it's just awesome to see the team going 
going forward this year. Uh, last year was a bit of a, a tough season, um, copying 97 points in anyone's uh, book isn't great. So um, to see us competing at, at the moment in pre-season, obviously waters have been untested because the season hasn't started yet, but uh, at the moment we're looking pretty good. That's good, eh? And you must be one of the highest paid non-23 players in the world if you're not in the 23. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd say uh, I'm probably not. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure you're probably the most uh, high-paid coach out there if I've ever seen one. But uh, no, nah, I don't mind running the water. Um, it hurts my feelings though, um, getting out there and not being a part of it. But got to take it on the chin, mate. It's all part and parcel. I think uh, the way the rules are, you can only play uh, five foreigners. I think we might get six um, because we've got a Fijian boy in the national sevens team. So um, the rules mean. When, to, uh, when Jojo's away, uh, we get another foreigner in. So um, so hopefully I can squeeze into the, the six at some stage and get a few minutes under the belt. You also have pretty stacked um, team of foreigners. Eh? Even um, Mum Pimpy, the South African winger, he can't even crack the starting lineup at the moment too. Eh? So there's some pretty good talent not playing for your side. Yeah, the Pimps has been awesome though. He's uh, he's come over full of energy. He's a, he's a top man um, and the Japanese boys love him. Um, I think what our team lacked probably last year and the last few years is just we haven't been able to have the foreigners' input to help coach the group. So it's predominantly been only a couple of us, but now we've got, uh, I can't even, I'd just throw a number out there, probably eight or nine, ten foreigners here at the moment. Um, and guys like TJ and that offering their sort of expertise and Tojo helping the back three. Like you can just see the the intellectual growth of the team like growing uh, week on week and in the four pack, I don't know much about forwards, but I'm sure the the South African boys are doing the same for for that side of it. So, yeah, I think that that's probably where we lacked is just we didn't have that reach because we've got a squad of fifty. So for having three coaches, it's pretty tough for them to coach individually. So to have the boys now, it's sort of happening naturally, which is good. And um, like I said, I think that'll help us when we do transition into the season if it if it does kick off. And how do the Japanese boys find you? Do they? Do they understand your banter, your Japanese? Um, the, the Japanese, they don't really get the sarcasm. Um, we've been trying to um, bait a few of them up and they, they don't take it very well. So we're going to be pretty careful. Um, we've got a couple of boys that are sort of coming to grips with the fact that uh, we're not that serious, um, your brother in particular. Um, but no, they're, they're all good boys. Like you wouldn't meet a better, a better bunch of boys for sure. They're uh, an awesome culture and, um, you know, that. They welcomed us in, well, welcomed me in for when I first got here, and uh, they haven't kicked me out yet. Um, but yeah, we'll see how that goes at the end of the season. <laughs> Good stuff. But anyway, we've got lots to get through, so um, let's go back to the start for young Martin Banks. Let's take us back to Reefton. What was it like for you? Yeah, it was good. I actually tried venturing up to Nelson when I was, uh, I think I was 12 or 13. Um, yeah, uh, realised that you live there, um, the superstar of, of Nelson College. So uh, I thought I'll, I'll try and stick to my my small pond of Reefton. Um, but no, it's uh, yeah, I think Reefton probably had its good things and its bad things. Um, growing up, I guess you grow up in a small town, and I don't know, you end up playing sports, and I don't know, it's pretty easy to be the best when there's not many sport people around. And um, I think growing up in that sort of life. So I think I got pretty hard hit when uh, when I came to the real world and met, <laughs> come and met some of the big boys of uh, the rugby world. But um, but yeah, as a lifestyle, it was awesome. Um, love to get back there. Don't know if I'll ever live there again, um, but always used to like getting back there for the race day. Um, bumped into you a couple of times there and yeah, it was, uh, it was good times. So you were one of six, am I right in saying that? You... One of six, yeah. Uh, four boys, two four boys, two girls, so um, I think I was a bit of an afterthought. Um, there's a massive gap between me and the next oldest. Uh, probably call myself a mistake there, Jabba, but um, I'm sure mum still loves me. <laughs> <laughs> and then how did you get into rugby? Or did you, you obviously, you're pretty talented from a very young age. The star of Reefton from five. <laughs> star of Reefton from five, nah. I think um, I started when I was uh, the old man had rugby posts built when I was about three or four. They're only about a metre high, a metre wide. Um, he used to run over top of me, and it probably flowed into my later life where people run over top of me, Jabba. But, uh, um, but I started, yeah, I think that's, if Dad hadn't done that to me when I was three years old, I probably would have been right now. But 
<laughs> no, I'm still unfazed by it. It cuts me deep down, but I just don't show it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, it just started out. I was just like any other um, boy, really, boy or girl. As a as you grow up, you follow your parents and your other family members around their sporting fields. And um, yeah, no, I was just one of those guys that would jump in the truck and go to the rugby game on Saturday. And then Sunday morning, I'd be off to watch rugby league. And um, like I said, I probably ended up in a pub too early. Um, Reefton really had no rules. So um, as long as you're sitting beside your old man or your brother, you could uh, pretty much do what you wanted. So in that respect, uh, probably wasn't good for good for the old upbringing. But um, yeah, it's just the way it goes in small, small towns, mate. I used to sneak the odd beer. Uh, used to get give it. Oh no, nah, this is this is later on. This is probably a ten or eleven. Um, sneaking drinks, sneaking drinks off the old man. Um, yeah, but it's pretty much my whole life from I'd say three to not four, not not drinking at three, but like following you run around the rugby fields from three to probably till I was sixteen, and I was playing um, rugby alongside the old man. So yeah, so thirteen years of following sport and drinking beer mate and you ended up playing with your old man hey yeah um yeah i don't know what he was up to there he's like 55 probably even older i don't actually think he knew how old he was to be fair um but yeah so there was all of us uh brothers we played the old game throughout the time and during i think it was 2005 and six um the old man he didn't play many minutes he'd come off the bench for about 10 got red carded and uh yeah like i think dad hung the boots up after that um yeah so it's uh didn't get to play the final with him but it's pretty special though it's something that i'll probably never get to do it with my son because i've probably left that run a bit late but um if i think if anyone ever got the chance i think uh it meant the world to me um you know watching dad play for so many years and then um, getting to play alongside him um yeah not not many you know sons get to do that so i was pretty lucky what do you get the red card for Missing, he threw an ear punch and then got then got dropped. So, um, so he got hit and yeah, so he missed and um, got a black eye. But yeah, it was pretty cool though. We got to go through to the final and end up having a beer. I think I was maybe fifteen then, having a legal beer on the coast. Um, but yeah, it was a good bus trip home. So got to have a beer alongside him, even though he couldn't play. What position were you playing at fifteen? Ten, and hiding. And senior, <laughs> senior rugby senior rugby yeah i had um my brother was playing 12 um yeah, yeah. so yeah I, like let's be honest jimmy the the rugby i think you even said it yourself i think you uh, got down to buller one week and told the buller coach that if uh, you had a forward pack you'd win the comp um so the, the competition was never real real strong but um it's, it's like any senior footy though like you go out the country and just big men that just they won't get you many times, but when they get you, they'll, they'll make sure you know about it. So I just tried not to be hit too many times. Obviously, didn't go into contact too many times, and uh, we're not we're not in too many tackles either. So I came out unscathed, mate. Fair enough. But then you ended up um, playing for Buller, guiding them to the Heartland Championship. Talk me through that. <clears throat> yeah, I think the Buller thing came about because, uh, and I think it was two thousand six. Um, I was actually going to play that year, but my, my old lady wouldn't let me because. She realises a little bit of a step up from club rugby to playing um, Heartland or NPC Division 2 or whatever it was back then or it was that long ago. But uh, So I was actually going to do it then and then the old lady knocked it on the head. Um, and it was it was largely just because um, the old man, he played 100 games for Buller and um, I guess it becomes sort of part of who you are growing up in the region. It's sort of getting the opportunity to go back and play for Buller um, just on the off chance I got injured. Um, playing in Christchurch it sort of just fell into place but yeah it was awesome like I knew a lot of the boys growing up and they were in the team as well and um, and then obviously when I played senior rugby in 2005 and 6 I'd actually played a lot a lot against a lot of the boys that were in the team sort of they were probably 40 by then but um, but yeah so it was an awesome awesome comp it's uh, you know something that I look back on pretty fondly and if I ever got the chance again I'd probably like to pull on the Buller jersey again um, Probably just to give just to give back a little bit because uh, without Buller I wouldn't have met um, Ben Coman and uh, James Foster um, and that way there, there was a Wymere boy and a, a Nelson uh, football club player there and um, they were the ones actually convinced me to go up to Nelson to have a crack at Tasman and um, 
nearly ended up at your club. Um, I don't think you would have been there, but um, Ben Coman twisted my arm and, and shacked me up at his. So I think, you know, the little things like that, you're sort of, at the time, you're not really too aware of, but looking back, like, that sort of moment probably shaped um, the rest of my career. So then you did make that move up to Nelson, um, had a standout season for Waimea Old Boys, uh, but you missed out on uh, the Tasman marker. So talk me through that. Talk me through that decision <coughs> in that year. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I don't know, I was just, I was pretty, had a crack in Canterbury. Um, found out there's a massive production line there and obviously went back to Buller and, um, Looking at Tassie and that, like I had a few mates that moved up, um, Kieran Fonatier, and um, I sort of bumped into Shane Christie a little bit um, through the Canterbury uh, Crusaders development and stuff like that. So, and they sort of planted the seed. Um, I wasn't too really wasn't really aware of where I'd sit in the scheme of things once I moved up there, but um, decided to move up and end up at Waimea, like I said, through Ben Coman, and he uh, took me under his wing there. I lived with him and uh, him and his partner um, in the house there, and. Um, yeah, it was like living with you again. Well, but actually, before I lived with you, uh, I was a little, I was a little boy again. Um, but yeah, Nelson was awesome. I went up there, and like you say, I missed that on the team. Uh, and I think you know, I met KK, KK and Leon, and I still remember sitting in the office uh, when they came to naming the team. And I thought that I'd probably done enough to sneak in the back door and pick up uh, one of the last spots. And I remember KK sat me down, and I've talked about it in the past, but I've never really acknowledged that KK was probably right. Um, he said I wasn't ready and looking back now I, I probably wasn't ready he said like if I was under his, under his and Leon's tutelage for a couple of years then I would be and uh, and at the time I was, uh, I was pretty pissed off I was, I was gutted that I hadn't sort of made the initial squad and um, then when I did get my chance and then obviously made the Tasman team and things went the way they did and it wasn't until later that I realised KK was actually right until I, until I went up and met you at the Canes and had that year, and um, that's where I think I realised that KK was actually talking about further down the line because he said in two years it had me playing Super Rugby, and um, you know when you're a little kid or not a little kid, a younger guy, you're like, oh, all I want to do is now play now and do this. But I think he was thinking long term, but I was pretty short sighted, so um, I wish I had KK there to give me the word of advice, saying you probably need another year before you get a Super Rugby. But I was pretty naive and um, went on my own little way and found out the hard way but um, that's the way it goes so how did you get that crack um for tasman because you you said you weren't ready but then you you played for tasman must have been three or four rounds into the comp with a 4xl t-shirt and you absolutely <laughs> carved it up i don't know if it was 4xl i think i was that was another thing like I, I probably wasn't physically ready i wasn't physically ready i think it was probably a medium but i still remember seeing some photos mate it was uh i've seen that jersey i've never seen it after the season but it was huge and i it was probably a combination of me being so skinny, probably about 80 kg and the jersey being too big. But um, yeah, it's sort of like looking back, that Tasman team was stacked. And um, for some reason, the boys struggled um, in the first couple of games. I think the first game uh, was against Tasman. Uh, not Tasman, against Southland. Sorry, we're obviously Tasman. But um, we struggled down there. And then uh, the second round, I can't remember who that was. But then Robbie picked up an injury um, before Counties. and. Um, I remember I was working for a builder, um, Andrew Martin. Uh, he sort of pulled me aside. He's he a associate with the Waimea Club and he's let me do a bit of cash work for him. Um, probably making his lunch more than anything on the building site. But uh, So at the time I was working for him and I remember Tasman, um, I can't remember who called me, but they were trying to get me to come in and train like with the team like during the week and take time off work. And I still remember saying to them, like, look, like, I can't just come in and give two days a week because obviously I would have live and i've got to have you know money coming in so i was like when you call me and say you can pay me for my time that i come in on during the week like after five o'clock or six o'clock it's fine but going in from nine till five unpaid was sort of sort of bit out of reach so um a couple of weeks after that i got a phone call and they said i oh, will pay you to come in for this week and it was again before the county's game i didn't think i was going to play off it it was just me going in to learn <laughs> and i remember kk came up to me and he was like oh um, we're going to play you this week. I was like, oh, far out. Like, there's one team that you probably don't want to debut against, and that's probably counties, because back then they had some big boys. Like, and remember, I was 80 kg and pasty white, and 
I just remember looking at that team and like they had Frank Hullai and he was going ballistic, Sherwin and Stairs. They had some big forwards and I was just like, I'm not ready for this. Like, <laughs> give me another week. Let me let me go back and play Southland or something. Like, it's uh, let the white battler play the white battlers. But um, yeah, KK threw me in the mix of the off Leon and I still remember them asking me what position I, I feel comfortable at. And at the time, like I went to school and, and Christchurch boys and up until Christchurch boys, I played 10 and then got to Christchurch boys and met Tyler Blindale and he was sort of the golden boy. I think he is at the same time as you, he's probably went toe to toe quite a bit. Um, so when I got there, Tyler was obviously the 10. So I sort of just floated around any of the other positions where I could pick up time. And I always thought I was a 10 until I got to Christchurch. And then from then I started playing fullback and uh, that's where I thought I was going to end up. So I just, when KK asked me, I was like, oh, I think I'm a better fullback than 10. And uh, anyway, that's where he put me. And I still remember during that game, it went, there was good patches and average patches. But I remember in the second half, like it was Dewey and I think we had a midfield scrum. It was a 4-2 split. And I was trying to call the ball off me because I just dropped the ball. Like literally dropped it cold. And I went up to your brother and I was like, just go left. And like, just let me, just let me recover here. And uh, it came right. It came right. And I dropped it again. Um, it went backwards, thankfully. But like those those two moments, I looked back and I was like, far out. Like I was just a deer in the headlights. Like I was just like, far out. Like, am I am I good enough to be here? And I think I was just lucky. Like I said, the team was so good that when I did go into second, uh, not second five, into first five, the team pretty much functioned on its own. And I think that's the team hit its straps probably the week after that. We played Otago and uh, run them off the park. And from that point, like the team just, it was just automatic. Like I just didn't have to do much. And I was probably lucky that I'd been put into 10 then because, it, like I said, it just ran itself. We had players in the back line, like your brother, and that, that did most of the work. And uh, I'd just thrown the ball pretty much. And obviously it looked like I was doing a lot, but I probably wasn't doing a heck of a lot, to be fair. <laughs> oh, so humble. And you obviously <laughs> became one of the Tasman heroes, um, started your own Facebook page, The Legend of Marty Banks, which has over 100,000 followers. Um I think that's actually more famous than uh, anything I achieved, mate. It's uh, got nothing to do with me, but he's done a hell of a lot better than I have. <laughs> you get asked that a lot. I know a few people ask that question. Uh, why did you set up that Facebook page and call it the legend of Marty Banks? No, you normally get some older people that don't really understand. And they ask me why I'm posting this stuff and why I'm talking about this stuff. I'm like, it's it's not me. Like, So I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that think it's the stupid person being me posting this stuff. And, like, I remember back early on, like, I remember there was a few, I could always take the digs at me, like, I, I was fine off that, but I remember there's a few times where a couple of posts would get put up about teammates or opposition and stuff like that, and I'm like, oh, just, if you're going to come on anyone as a joke, just come at me, because, like, I don't really want this tied to, tied to, tied to me, so I was a bit worried about it at that start, but I messaged, and he, ever since then, he's been pretty good, and um, he's doing what he's doing, and obviously, sort of branched out to a bit more than just about Marty Banks, which is ideal. Is it true you're paying him? <laughs> I wish I had that sort of money to pay him. I, I, um, but no, nah, he's uh, he actually went to Reefton and uh, I think he actually did a photo shoot at the Reefton races for my sister. I think they were doing a fashion in the fields thing. So he's met the family. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know too much other more than that though. <laughs> oh, how good. And obviously your um, championship final was a big moment of your Tasman <laughs> career. The big memory that stands out for everyone, you getting your intercept try, hot dogging, pointing up to God, and about the halfway, knowing that you've got the gas to score. <laughs> what, what a G was it? Yeah, because I, I think that all came from, because uh, that whole year it was always, because obviously the premiership and the championship, but there was always the thing about, me and Ehi and Ehi and me and um, I remember that whole week was just there was just people into me about how Ehi is going to uh, tear us to bits and all this sort of stuff and I just remember like I never ever got worked up before a game and uh, for some reason when I got that intercept I like, I look back on it and I've apologised to so many people for it I should not celebrate ever and I should not celebrate before half time because like. It's just not smart. I, I think just their emotions just took over, and um, yeah, I actually didn't even know if I was on side, so I shouldn't have been celebrating because I wasn't actually sure if I was safe. So I remember scoring, and your brother was here. I was like, was I even on side? He was like, oh, I don't know. And then I oh, just sort of 
came about that I was, I was just by chance. So yeah, I can't really remember too much. I remember uh, in that second half, I had a brain explosion and kicked a crossfield kick that ended up in a try. And I remember just thinking in my head, I was like, fire it up, this costs us a game. KK's going to have me by the nuts here. And I remember walking off after the game, we'd, we'd still won. And I couldn't look KK in the eye because I was so terrified that he was going to come at me about it. So I literally probably avoided him for, I would say, the whole whole end of year do I'd say I didn't want anything to do with him <laughs> <laughs> it's ruthless, though. and then obviously the other final that you played in was the premiership final one yeah that... I knew this was I knew this was going to come up I knew this was coming up uh I remember you and actually that whole year like I actually talked about this the other day and we played you boys obviously early on in the season obviously down in Tasman and down in Nelson there and the one who's come back and won late in the piece and uh 82 minutes. Yeah, and it was, uh, I still remember, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was this game. It could be, I could have crossed my, crossed my wires here, but I remember there was you and Kurt Baker, and uh, I think Marty McKenzie ran a 1 3 cut with Seta Tamanivalu. And uh, this game, I remember it. Was it the same game? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Seta obviously went through me and scored. Um, <laughs> and literally, I, it happened that fast that. Somehow, Kurt had come from wherever he came from. You had come from wherever you had come from, and you were both just in my grill. I would say, I don't know, it felt like an eternity, but you were just in my grill the whole time. Like, ever since then, I was just like, I hadn't actually met Kurt before then, and I went on to meet, I actually went on to play at the Highlanders with Kurt, but until the point where I actually met him, I thought he was a complete asshole, And I actually had that much to do with you either, and other than Tom being your brother, I actually thought you were an asshole too. So, um, yeah, so like it was, uh, oh, I still haven't let that brush off my back. But then obviously. I think it got us the played, victory in the end. Oh, we end up, yeah, that hurt. That's, uh, yeah, I still don't know how we lost that game. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't great. But that's the way it goes, Jabba. Um, you take that on in your stride. But yeah, then the final just happened again. Like I didn't get steamrolled in the final, but. The whole game, I could just, you and Kurt were just chipping away and uh, like it was just relentless. Like it, it, it didn't, it wasn't anything that hurt me like mentally or anything, but it was just like the annoyance of your voice, just like talking absolute crap. Like it's a painful voice to listen to. And then you got both of you just going left and right. It's just like far out. So hey, if you were coughing two voices, <laughs> I was coughing about 10. <laughs> that whole Marco yeah. team was into me that day. That was ruthless. Yeah, you probably deserved it. It's probably been probably all that time you spent at the Marcos. Those boys has probably bottled it all up. So you, I, I, I actually not going to defend them for that. I think it's your own fault. But the final, I think, yeah, I like I look back and I think it was as a spectacle. It was awesome that Canterbury wasn't in it. <laughs> um, I remember it was such a huge, like just the build up to it, like just the publicity that it got because it was so so foreign like you know every every final is meant to be in Christchurch and Canterbury is meant to win it and um the week before we we played Canterbury and I think what you guys met us with at the start of the final is probably what we met Canterbury with in our semi-final and like we were so up for that semi-final it was just ridiculous and then obviously we we're up for you guys but I think what we met from you guys was just like a whole different level to what we'd experienced that year and like the intensity that you just played on the Obviously, you had an awesome team, but like I think the energy that the whole region brought you guys was just incredible. And then, yeah, like coming out, like well, I don't think we we're overawed by it all. Um, I think you know we went up there like with every intention to throw the seed round, and um, we just got hit on the nose pretty early a couple of times. And um, I'm sure we're going to talk about my kicking there. And Cody Ray obviously had an absolute blinder. And yeah, like I think you know there was a few things that you need to go your way in the final and. Kicking's one of them, but uh, yeah, I remember like I think Chris Smiley kicked the ball over Bryce Heem's head, and Bryce Heem ran back, and then it bounced over, and then you just picked it up, and that was from your own goal line. So like little bits of luck that sort of went your way early on, and then obviously just the intensity that he's brought sort of put us in a spot where we were chasing our tails for a lot of it, and uh, I still remember vaguely like I think we couldn't remember exactly the time we had left, but. I'd say about five, six minutes left and we'd just scored a try and I think you were up by I'd say five, I think. You'd kicked off and we were exiting and uh 
Glenn Jackson called us on a penalty for one of our players advancing in front of the kicker. Probably hadn't, I hadn't seen that call the whole year and it pops up in the final 30 metres in front and Cody kicking the way he'd been kicking, he wasn't going to miss. So that was the dagger. I think if that hadn't happened, then it would have made for a hell of a last five minutes. But, but that took the wind out of our sails. So. It sort of took away any hope of, of pinching that game. And um, But yeah, like I look back on it like it's one of them ones that's always going to hurt. Like even teammates like Fonny get stuck into me all the time because he knows that that game really hurts me. Um honestly like, didn't know you'd miss that many kicks until I talked to Fonny and he is just oh, into you all the no, time. No, Fonny, I reckon Fonny's <laughs> going to have it tattooed on his arm. That's how proud of it he is. Like he's he's obviously gutted that we lost, but he's so proud that I missed so many, so many kicks. How but, many did you miss? Like, I don't remember I missing too many. Nah, I actually, I, I actually can't remember. It would probably be... Nah, 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 nah. nah. I, I'm, it would be three or four, probably four. Um, but the only thing, like, I remember, like, because coming from Buda, like, I, I'd never changed. Like, I went from club rugby. I actually played a club game for Reefs in the year I got selected for Tasman. So I went Buller, Tasman, and nothing changed. So I never got, never had any real process to, like, doing what I did. So before the games, <coughs> the day before the game, I wouldn't go kick at goals or anything. I would just kick before the game. And the only thing I can really put the brain farts down to my kicking were, um, the night before we went down and kicked at the stadium and it's quite of a weird stadium it always gets well every time I played there the wind comes in at different angles and um, the night before it was doing one thing and then the next night it was doing on game night it was doing something else so I ended up my head like I had no coping mechanisms my head was like like what's this ball gonna do and like I just every time I've gone back there like I've, I've gone back there since and it's always been the same but um, I just wish I learned that I should just trust just trust my kicking process because after that, like I think I kicked real well. <laughs> it's just because the wind was just, uh, yeah, mentally mentally got me and um, whether that was it or not. But um, yeah, it just hurts that it was in the final. And yeah, I think there was a chant going around the stadium. I don't know if you started that. The Marty's got a bowler chant. Um, I didn't actually know what they were saying, but yeah, it's sort of always been a love hate thing with Taranaki. Every time I've gone back there, there's just been hate like I don't know why like it's always been hate like semi-finals finals just round robins like there's just people up there that just come at someone else you know there's there's, there's 14 other people on the field but it's uh nah it is it's pretty cool though like um after the game you go and talk to those people and have a laugh so yeah it's, it's all part of the job so now the moment is this famous moment where you've Scaled a beer, talking about that love hate relationship. What's happened there? They've thrown a beer at you. Yeah, love hate again. The Naki. Um, we went up for the semi final. So when you said the final, it was just noise, so you couldn't hear anything. But the semi final, there weren't as many people, so you could hear everything that these these people were saying, like just abusing me. Like the game would be stopped, and you'd just be getting abused. Like no matter what was going on, any chance you got a earshot from them, they would just be abusing me, and it was just. Again, like the whole semi, uh, the whole final thing against Hawks Bay, where the emotions just sort of came out. I managed to hold on to it the whole game this time, and uh, when I scored the try at the end of the game, the emotions came out, and I just it was right in front of this group, and I was I, I probably wanted to give them the fingers. I probably that's probably what went through my mind was give them the fingers, but you probably can't do that on uh, on live TV unless you're uh, Jamie Booth. <laughs> um, <laughs> Andrew Murray, um, yeah, Carlos Spencer, there's been a few. Yeah, yeah see, I, I'm not at their status, so um, all I had was a ball, so I threw the ball at them, and yeah, yeah, but threw the they threw the beer at me. Way worse. Hey, threw the ball at them. Well, they're quite a wee way away because your field's it's quite a weird field, obviously the cricket ground. But I was close enough to get the ball at them, so I stood up and threw the ball at them, just in their direction. Whether it went into the stand, I don't know. My arms aren't big enough, so I probably couldn't get it there, but. Um, yeah, so then they threw the beer at me, but went on and we finished the game. But then after the game, you go over and um, they're all shaking your hand and you're laughing and like sort of just duck off, water off the duck's back, um, so to speak. So, but I think that's the best thing about sort of provincial footy is whether it's playing for Buller. The same thing happened in Buller, like I played against East Coast, and I remember I had this, I was kicking before the game, and there was these. Uh, young kids behind the post they probably would have been three or four and uh 
they ran off with one of my balls and uh this lady this lady was just beside me just laughing at me like laughing at the fact that this kid had taken the ball and they're like go get it go get it i was like there's not a chance like there's not a chance i'm going to take that ball off that young kid while i'm in Rotoria. like there's not any chance in hell so i've been copying flack from kids adults probably old people as well like it's just part of who i am mate and uh i've got better at handling it um yeah just the outburst of reaction sort of get the better of me sometimes what a tazzy career and have we skipped over Russia, one of the craziest? Yeah, Russia. Russia was. Yeah, Russia. I think Russia was pre buller Yeah, it was pre buller pre buller Yeah, it was a long time ago, two thousand and eleven. Um, How yeah, old it were was, you? Uh, hey. How old were you? Uh, I think I was twenty one. Twenty one when I got there. Yeah, no good with maths, but I think it was twenty one. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, Brad Moore sent me there. Um, by chance, it sort of um, just the way it panned out. But again, it was sort of, I got to a crossroads. I was like, well, can't make it in Canterbury. Then went to North Harbour and couldn't make it in Harbour. So I was like, stuff it, I'll just go overseas and um, do it that way and just have a look around. So, but yeah, it was it was crazy. Russia was, um, you know, I've talked about it um, on Sky TV, but it's probably easy to talk about it here because uh, it's not going out to all of New Zealand. But Russia was just a whole different ball game, like, the sites we've seen like we got we went to this uh this area it was um it was owned by the ceo or something like that it was it was sort of like just this big open piece of land that had a few houses on it um and it turned out that it was just like the bosses of the city like the police like the head of police and stuff like that where it was it was sort of like a holiday destination where they could go and just get locked into their own gate so you and i can't just walk on in there like unless we've been invited and uh, I remember going in there and there was just like AK-47s that we could shoot into the water. Uh, marijuana growing like wildfire. It was it was ridiculous. Like there was literally no rules. I guess the only rule was don't do anything stupid to harm anyone else. And uh, yeah, like it was just opening. Like there was people out shooting like bears and bringing them back with like their skins and stuff like this. It was just ridiculous. Like a lot of the boys that were there, they went back and actually hunted the bear um, during the winter and stuff like that. So like the options are endless in Russia. Um, you just got to know the right people. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it was a great place. Like it's actually you think about Russia and you're like, why the hell would I go there? But to get the invite, like, yeah, like if if I was in a better position rugby wise, I definitely wouldn't have gone. But just having the opportunity, <laughs> having the opportunity, <laughs> yeah, having the opportunity to go somewhere like that was uh, yeah, it shaped you as a person, like. Yeah, you'd be out in a nightclub and you just have people like looking you up and down like they just want to deck you and like but it was just ridiculous like the club looked after us in a way like there was always links to the mafia like we've sort of been told like by via other people outside the club that the club had ties to the mafia and all this sort of stuff and yeah so it was sort of pretty eye-opening like i'd go home and i used to have Faden phillips so when i first got there i live with Faden phillips he used to be a halfback um I think he played a bit in New Zealand schools and stuff like that. And uh, when I first got there, we were together, but he got sent home. So then these mind games started playing. Like when he went home, I was like locked in this little like apartment block. And I was like, far out. Like if I piss someone off, they're going to come knock on my door. Like I was only 21. Like I had no idea what was going on really. And um, I, it was the, the cap. So it was sort of like Japan where you can only have a certain amount of players. Um, but obviously they, they don't have enough money well, at the time, didn't have enough money in Russia to be able to fund a heap of foreigners to be there without playing. So they they sent one home. I actually met a guy called uh, Rangi. He was uh, one of Bodhi's good mates. He actually turned up. I remember seeing him turn up and uh, he had Bodhi's, all Bodhi's kit on. And I was like, far out like this. This guy must be someone, but he was just a piss sinking animal. <laughs> and uh, I was just like, far out. But he met some absolute legends. Uh, Glenn Gregory, you know Glenn Gregory from Tassie. He was over there. He was like the age difference was probably I think Glenn was a few years older than me, so they were finished. Like they were they were done pretty much off their career and just looking to piss up. And I was still pretty young, so I was like, "Far I can I want to be a professional rugby player here." So when I first got there, I was like, "I'm not going to drink," but then by the end of it, I was verging on probably an alcoholic. So um, you either fit in or you get kicked out. So um, yeah, but it was crazy that you go some rugby fields were just like obviously not a massive sport in in Russia. Um, 
you know, we play on some real dirt tracks. Um, I'm sure you would have seen a few in your time traveling overseas, but yeah, it was just carnage. There was no, it was like our, our stadium had a, a grandstand and stuff like that, but a lot of teams were just like thrown together bits of steel. And, um, but yeah, you sort of come back and appreciate home. Like it's, yeah, I'd go back there though. I'd, I'd go back for a holiday. I don't know if I'd go back and play, but I'd go back and have a look around because once I got there, we got no chance to look really. It was just play rugby, go back. And so that was the only sort of downfall, but um, probably can't go back now because uh, I think they caught wind of me talking about the place uh, on Sky Sports. So they'll probably have a bounty on my head. <laughs> I know you've made up a few yarns about the mafia. How how true are some of those yarns? <laughs> no, I, see, this is where it's going to get niggly because I actually, when I had that interview, when I did the interview, I actually waited because I'd watched you prank all the boys. I watched you get every single lad. I was waiting for a phone call. I was like, Jimmy will probably try find some Russian person to call me here and stitch me up on a phone call. Like, I was just like for probably a month afterwards, I was like, there's not a chance. If I get a Russian phone call here, I'm coming back at heat and I could end up in a world of hurt because it could not be you. But um <laughs> Because because the thing was, is when I did the interview, it got posted in Russia and I got a message from um, this rugby page in Russia saying, we remember you, Marty Banks, with a wink. And then I woke up and clicked on the page, but the post had been removed. So obviously someone had told them to take it down. So I started getting a little bit sketchy about it. But um, yeah, so like I was like, Jimmy, this is, if Jimmy rings me pretending to be a Russian. He, he'll have me here. So I've just got to come back. I've just got to come back with Pete. Um, but the mafia thing, like, I was told, like, um, so we had a grandstand on the left-hand side of the field. And on the right-hand side was the office block. But there was a blacked-out, um, literally tinted-out um, room above the office block. And the only way you can get in there was, like, there was no steps to it outside. It was just tunnel. Like, you go in it via a tunnel. And you could just see, obviously, with tinted windows, you can still see through them, but you don't know really what's behind them but you can see body like people in there and we were told that this is where like some of the mafia was sitting like and it was just like holy heck of, like whether they're there or not i don't know this is just stuff that we got fed but um like when you get handed a bag of cash at the end of your contract like you start to wonder um yeah they told me it's because i didn't have my bank account set up properly but yeah but uh i'm sure it's all i know the team now they're sort of in a second division european comp I think so obviously a lot of that has to be ironed out like um the money side of it but like i'd turn up to training some days and i'd just say oh, i'm not going to train until i get some money and they'll bring me this black or this brown like paper bag and give me a couple of thousand new zealand dollars and see me right for another month or two on the piss and um yeah it was just like <laughs> no nah, because it said in my contract that if, if i don't get paid then i don't have to train so I'd tell them in the morning at the gym where I probably wasn't lifting too much weight, to be fair. I was just probably floating around the gym, ghost setting it. Uh, and I just mention it there and then literally gets afternoon training and they just have this piece of paper to sign and give me some money. And yeah, it was just like an eye-opening experience. Like you take for granted um, playing in New Zealand, your money turns up on the first and you got people that you sort of look after you a little bit in terms of your rugby contracts and stuff. But yeah, without that, like, being able to compare where I am now or what I've been through in New Zealand to where I was in Russia, like it's just perspective is crazy. Mm. What a what an experience! Because you obviously went, experience. you obviously went by yourself as a single lad. Lots of beautiful Russians, and you've always been very good with ladies. I know your beautiful <laughs> girlfriend listens to this, so, but any stories? <laughs> <you want> to <laughs> share? <laughs> no, yeah, she's uh, she hit the jackpot. The Michelle did. She's uh, she really. You know, she really reached for the top of the apple tree and she, she got a nice apple. Um, glad she didn't bottom feed. Um, but uh, I really struggled in Russia because uh, the language barrier, Jimmy. Um, and I've said this in the past that I actually hadn't played Super Rugby then, so um, couldn't use the Super Rugby card in Russia. Um, so, yeah, sort of, I'm just floating on by, mate. It's uh, To be fair, the other first five that was there, he's a Kiwi. Um, he's come back and he's got a Russian partner. Um, one of the guys is married to a Russian. Um, yeah, so it was all there. I think Boogie Horton, he's got a Russian partner. So I was probably the only ones that didn't come back with a Russian. Um, Michelle's pretty lucky in that respect. Um, so, yeah, but no, I, I would have struggled over there either way, mate. 
Well, speaking of super rugby, let's go to your super rugby journey. Obviously, you your first taste was at the Hurricanes. Um, you were welcomed into my lovely home. And I've got to thank you for, I guess, preparing me and my wife, four kids, because um, looking after you gave us a good taste. It made, I guess, made kids a little bit easier um, once we looked after you. So um, how was your super rugby experience? Yeah, I guess that's probably what, uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for taking me under your wing there, Jabba. Um, but I guess that's sort of where I was sort of going with the KK and Leon stuff earlier. It's sort of, you don't want to talk too much about it there because you, I knew what was coming in, in the later part of the the podcast because I knew the, the Kane stint wasn't going to be avoided. Um, but I think, yeah, like coming through at Tassie, um, that, especially that first year, like I said, like our team was so good that I probably personally didn't experience... Uh, too many poor performances. Like I'm sure, like I said, there's some brain farts throughout the throughout the games, but a lot of them were pretty hidden because our team was going so well. So as a as an individual, like I think that year went so well that I probably set myself up well for failure at, at some stage. Because um, going on what KK said, like I I clearly wasn't physically ready. I was winged my way through ITM Cup because you can probably get away with that, but. Once I hit Super Rugby, and uh, at this stage, I probably still didn't know what position I wanted to play. Um, obviously, going to the Canes, you got Bodie, um, and uh, you're pretty well aware of where you sit in the picking order when you got someone like Bodie at, at ten. So, uh, obviously, you got pushed more to fullback um, alongside yourself there, Jabber. I think early on you were injured. I'm pretty sure. Were you injured early on? No, nah. I was. I don't think I was. I think yeah. you just got the first crack at fifteen and. I remember you yeah. doing pretty well for probably the first five weeks or so, <laughs> which was a pretty good stint. And then the famous game down at Foresight Bar. Oh, Foresight Bar. And it was the end so of it. I, st- I still remember turning up. I remember the first day of pre I knew where I knew I was in trouble was first day of pre season. We did our, I think it was a yo yo test. I think at way out, like Paraparumi way past there, I think. And then uh, we went out and did a hard field session. And it was pissing down with rain. And then we got sent on a massive run around the waterfront and back. And Cully Gibbons was just going like flat out. So just got humped at training, did a whole fitness thing. And then another fitness thing on the end, I was like, holy heck, like this is a whole different ball game. Like, and that's where I started thinking like, oh, I'm so far behind the eight ball. But then went to Africa and uh, yeah, like things went all right. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I set the world on fire or anything, but I didn't do anything too, too terrible. Um, and then I came back. And I actually, I should blame you for this, to be fair, because uh, you were actually meant to start that game at four so far, from memory. Yeah, you were definitely meant to start it. And I think you got, you came out because I was on the bench and you got withdrawn um, with injury. I'm sure of it, because I remember your everlasting words inside my head were, don't lose that 15 jersey. <laughs> and like, being a young buck, like, I didn't really, I wasn't too really aware of like what the Highlanders game plan was in terms of like all their box kicks and stuff. But when I got down there and Nuggy put every kick on the button for 45 minutes, like, and to this day, I still don't think Patrick Osborne was even trying to catch the ball. Like, I just think he was just jumping at me and like, it was just carnage. Like, I just, and I think that's where mentally, like I, I wasn't prepared for like a, a performance like that like a poor performance like that. I think that was where KK was sort of, you know, like the, the mental development, the physical development. I just, I just wasn't there and I hadn't experienced, like I said, that those poor performances to put me in good stead to be able to manage like a poor start to the game. And I started poor. I remember far out the, the kickoff, they kicked it a meter in from touch and I ran across the take it and I nearly took it into touch and I had to throw it inside to Jules and I was like, fire out, that was close. And I wish that I wish that was the worst of it because fire out, it just got worse. And I just remember like my head was gone probably even halfway through the first half. Like I just remember I was like, I was looking for the gate. Um, yeah. And like, I just, I just remember like offloads and missed tackles and drop high balls. Like the list just goes on. And but it was just, my head was gone so early in the game that, I was destined to to get hooked pretty early, and I think like looking back, like if I had KK or someone tell me I needed another year before, obviously I didn't go seek advice, so it's my own fault. Like I didn't have anyone in my corner, like a an agent at the time that said just hold off a year. Like 
like I said, I was just young, seen a super rugby contract. I was like, bang, I'm going. But looking back now, like if I had gone and seek some advice from KK or Leon, they probably would have said, hold off just because they knew I probably wasn't ready. But the harsh reality is like that game now, as bad as it is looking back, like I've never watched it, never watched it ever. But what I learned there about myself probably shaped the rest of my career. Like far out, like it taught me so much in that one game. Like a lot of guys go into Super Rugby, like you look at Geordie and D-Mac and the young talent coming through now, they just, they just transition and go on through with smooth sailing. But, um, but when you're a battler and you and you cop a hard game like that, um, especially early on in your Super Rugby career, it's hard to get back on the horse, I guess. Like once you have a poor game, you're pretty much pushed to the bottom of the pile and you only get another look in unless we have about 20 injuries. So, and I, I was fine with that side of it, but um, like that whole year taught me a lot. Like I look back and like preseason went all good. Um, I was playing 10 um, and stuff like that. So like that side was a ride. And like I look back and, like the Canes environment was awesome. Like I, I loved every minute of it. I was just disappointed in myself that I didn't sort of make the most of that opportunity. Would you want to want to have played the next week if you were selected, or were you pretty keen to just say, "Oh, I can't, well, I can't the handle ne- that yeah, at the, the moment." Fire out! I think like the, it took me so long. Like I remember after that game, I remember we stayed um, above the casino, and uh, obviously don't mind a punt, but. I, I literally went back to the room and the boys went out for beers and that. I just remember, I still remember sitting in the room and I was like, I was distraught. Like I was like, yeah, I was well gone. And like that next week, I probably would have, my head probably still would have been wrecked because I wouldn't have had no coping mechanism. I would have just been probably in a dark hole that whole week. I can't remember, but it wouldn't have been great. Like, yeah, it, it probably took me a few, a, a fair while to come back from that. Um, and I think once the season finished um, and went back to Tassie, there were still talks that I was sort of talking to uh, the Canes that I could possibly go back there. So they were talking about there was a contract to go back. And in my head, I was like, fire out. Like, if I go back there, I'm going to be in the same position. I'll hold tackle bags. Um, obviously not going to look in at 10 because by that stage, I sort of come to the fact that I'm a 10 um, after dropping so many high balls. But, um, and I sort of, I remember talking to the agent because by this time I'd actually got hold of an agent that I've still got now and I remember saying to him on a phone call pretty early on in my team cup that I'm pretty keen to like try and play myself into another super rugby team and at the time I had nothing so we actually said no to the Canes like I, I knocked that back just because not because I didn't want to go back but like I knew just where I'd sit and I like the going back there I'd probably end up putting more pressure on myself because I'd gone so poorly that I was always going to be fighting an uphill battle. Um, so I sort of guess I bet on myself that I knew I was better than that. And, um, and then that year I played for Tassie and we went well again. That's the year where we met you guys in the final. But as a, as a whole, the season went pretty well. And um, I'm sure through a few words from probably Joe Wheeler and Shane Christie and that to the Highlanders, um, the Highlanders gave me a call and um, asked me to head down there. And to be fair, I don't know why the hell they're looking at me after, after the heat. Seen how terrible I went down at the at Forsyth Bar there the year before. So I was like, if they're stupid enough to take me on and give me a chance, then they must see something. So, um, and that's how it came about was Brownie and Jamie Joe and um, yeah, Joe Wheel and that. So, yeah, going down there, like, uh, yeah, the harsh reality of the year before put me in better stead going down there. So, and, and how did you find it down there? What was the difference? Yeah, I think going down there, like I, I knew Sops was there and I knew Quasi Parker were there. And, uh, but I think at the time, like as a 10, and even like Lima would have admitted to, like he was pretty up and down with his performances at, at that level. And I remember the year before he was sort of up and down, but he sort of had that luxury of being able to get in week out because he was sort of the, the number one dog there. And um, I remember going down there and I knew Lima was still the, the number one team, like I was under no illusions that that's how it was. And me and Quasi were going to fight for the bench spot, but I sort of just sensed an opportunity that we could probably push Lima and, and see if, see if we could um, get a bit more game time and start off. All right. Jamie Joe called us in and pretty much told us what we really know. Lima's here. You're here. Quasi, you and are down the bottom. And we're like sweet as, but round one, um, Sop started. Um, he got play of the game and, um, I remember Jamie Joe, like I was none the wiser. Jamie Joe came up to me straight after the game. He was like, you're starting next week. And I was like, 
Barrett, how can you put Sops has just got part of the game? I'm like, and I was I'm good mates with Sops, and at the time I was like, you can't pull Sops out and give me a start when he's just got part of the game. And but then I found out that Sops actually had a, a family thing he had to go away to, so uh, we played the Reds and I got part of the game. So I was like, um, I was like, far out, is this a, this could be a 50-50 go here. Like if I can just keep chipping away at Sops here, I might um, be able to push my way in, but. From that point on, like Sops just went bang, and his year was just ridiculous. I think he got Player of the Year for the Super Rugby, and just doing willy nilly stuff that Brownie was telling him to do, like over the head chips, and like when you got guys like that in front of you doing stuff like that, you just got to sit back and just say fair play. And, um, but just the environment was it was awesome. Like I'd, I'd like to think that Quasi and I sort of helped Lima, I don't know, go to the next level a little bit obviously not just us but having a little bit of pressure on his tail like you could just see him build into that season like he never put in a, a bad performance so like it was just one of them years you just take your hat off and and shake his hand and um sit behind him and try and pick up any minutes so yeah and yeah but the the whole highlanders environment just suited me down to the ground like obviously loved a beer um can't drink many of them but loved a beer um Joey obviously had a field day with me with his Highlanders TV stuff, but just the way the whole, like, you're here to work, but as soon as the, the work's finished, you can go and enjoy yourself. And I think that sat pretty well with well, our whole our whole group. Like, we had Ethan Misfits down there that just gelled early on and probably didn't deserve on paper or anyone's opinion to go the way we did. Um, but just the way we went about our work, um, just the way the boys enjoyed themselves away from rugby, but obviously got flogged at training. Um, yeah, just, it just built a culture that was pretty awesome to be a part of. And you spoke about minutes there, and you obviously played some pretty important minutes <laughs> at the business end of the season. Coming on with, what, maybe 15, 20 to go, guiding the Highlanders' side to super rugby victory with a I wish, drop goal. This I makes up was... for all your missed kicks in Taranaki. <laughs> I wish it was 15 or 20 minutes. It felt like 80 minutes. But, uh, no, I don't actually know how. It was probably 11 and a half, I reckon. But <laughs> I don't know how but... long. Then and a half. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I don't know the exact number, but it wasn't many. Socks never really left me with too many. Um, I bet you it was 11 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably look it up. It could be. I'm actually not sure. But it wasn't too much more or too much less. But like I said, like the whole year, I remember coming on throughout the end of the games and, you only really set up for failure when you come on with that much time to go. Like you can't really do too much good, but you can actually like ruin the game. <laughs> so, so like the whole year I was sitting on that pine and I was just like, fire out. That's you you're pretty much looking at the clock and you're looking, uh, there's a 20 minute mark to go. You're doing fitness at the end of the game, no matter what. And that was always the, that was a real dagger. Cause you sit there you're like, Oh, I'm not on yet, but, but I haven't got to the fitness mark. But as soon as that laps, you're just like, ah, oh, fuck this like i'm gonna run shuttles after this but um surely not so a final got... no nah, not after the final no I, I did my best to sneak away from a few throughout the season um when we pinched a couple of games we'd um managed to avoid the trainer which was ideal but now nah, the final was yeah again like i going back to the cape and hold it held a few obviously daunting memories um yeah but going back there it was that was carnage that was like the Mitre 10 Cup final on on steroids like that environment running out even just to the bench I was just like holy heck like sitting on the pine great place to be and just hearing like the noise and just like there was so much energy in that stadium and the game was just going back and forth and I, I, I got to the point with like halfway through the second half I was like I ain't getting on here like there's not a chance like so I was just sitting there enjoying the spectacle and then bloody sops um, pulled up tight with his hamstring or something. And I was like, oh, I'm on here. So sink or swim with freaking four point stuff. I was, I was hoping Sops would give me a bit more of a lead. But um, but yeah, and I still remember the first play where I came on. He's had a 20 meter line out. And I was like, the bus is coming here. The bus is coming. And I was like, holy heck, it. Let's, let's get mentally prepared for this. And then uh, we had the, the play where we didn't attack you. We didn't attack you more than I think we come around and got a penalty. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Would have been a different uh, final. Bus would have scored under the pace. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, it would have hurt. But oh, it would have been terrible. Oh, the more we spent down the end, like your half was, oh, it was, it was a godsend. But, um, yeah, I'll still never forget Roscoe not scoring that try at, uh, 
I would have liked to have just to dot that ball down and, and pretty much put the game to bed. But uh, yeah, it just played out the way it did. And big old bus comes over with Bodie and, and stops a prop meter out from the line. But yeah, and then obviously what happened after that was, yeah, because we, we hadn't really practiced the drop goal in training. We'd kick drop goals after training just with our own pressure between me and stops, but hadn't done it in a game setting. So I don't think we actually worked through the process of how we we're going to go about it. No, because you had uh, a few cracks at it, eh? I remember you dummying yeah. a couple, and I was like, oh, yes, Banksy's choking. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I wanted to get rid of them, but I didn't have anyone else around me. Like, everyone was so tired that everyone was in front of me. And before I was kicking the ball, I was like, you have to be certain that this you're going to get this kick away. Like, if it misses, it's sweet, but you don't want to get charged down here because... Like you don't want to be that guy that gets charged down and they score under the sticks and you lose by three or four points, whatever it would be, three points. So like I could just see Colsey and TJ, like they were in every ruck. They would just sit beside the ruck. And as soon as Nuggie touched the ball, they were just gone, both feet. And I was just like, oh, nah, not this one. <laughs> and then not the next one. And then the one that we didn't actually try and like plan in any way, like it caught you off guard a little bit. So gave me a bit of time. So I wanted to get it away on the first two, but it was just in the back of my head, like this could go terribly wrong if this gets charged down because no one was going to chase back. It would have been game set and uh, probably would have had you yelling at me again. So don't need that too many times in my life. I'm gutted I didn't get into you earlier now that I heard, heard about what, what effect it had on, <laughs> no, on you and the other I've players. been asked so many times who the worst people are in rugby and you and Crack, 100%, without a doubt. Like, yeah, it's just, and after living with you, like, I know it's just rugby, like, and you obviously talk a lot of shit, like, and that's why I probably didn't want to come on the podcast, because I was a bit worried about what might come up, but, like, just having to deal with you constantly, um, yeah, it was it was tough work, but I had the little da- downstairs dungeon there, so I used to sneak off and get away from you, and well, not so much Brebury, Brebury was awesome, but more so you. <laughs> But anyway, that, that ball just sailed through the upright. You win Super Rugby. What a moment. How were those celebrations? Yeah, I remember we sat in your, your, your uh, the other changing shed for hours. We were in there. I wouldn't even know what time we left. But, yeah, it was absolutely awesome. I remember we went back to the, the hotel and it was a bit of a blur. Like, a bit of a shame. Like, I didn't realise because I was so naive and immature, I guess, to how it all works, I guess, like. I thought we'd go back and it'd just be the team. So all my family was up there, but they'd all gone home to bed. Um, but when we got back to the hotel, we had families and stuff there. I was like far out, like would have been cool just to have my family there. But the, by the time I messaged, they were all tucked up. So looking back at that, it was, you know, you sort of would have been cool to spend it with your family, but um, to have them at the game was pretty awesome. Um, but then the celebrations were, it was just endless. Like you win a trophy like that, I'm sure you would have experienced. <laughs> but you look at it, every day you turn up to India do and it just lifts your spirits a little bit and just gives you a little bit of energy and in time and need so like we had it on a I think the game was on a Saturday and we got to Thursday night and we didn't have the trophy but we got our manager to drop us off drop it off to us and as soon as it came through the door the energy level just came up and like we found another day and it was just yeah it was just embraced by everyone like I think like I've sort of talked about it like it when the Crusaders won a final, it's sort of, it, it's pretty common. Um, like when, when you won your first title with the Canes, it would have been, you know, embraced for the community like massively. So in Dunedin, like so many people have been waiting like 20 years for that, that trophy to turn up in the centre of Dunedin. And when it turned up, like the response from the public was just like ridiculous. Like, yeah, like we went around and like grown men crying and like it was just, at the time you didn't realize what you'd done but like that was sort of pretty pretty humbling when you're seeing like just so much emotion just be- for a rugby trophy you know and a, and it meant so much to the community so that was pretty cool to to sort of bring that bring that down and um, obviously tony brown what year was that i don't actually know what year that was the party at tony brown's that didn't eventuate sort of eventuated a bit later yeah and then, so obviously you moved off to Treviso, but or you signed with Treviso, but you didn't actually go. So was that the following year? What happened there? Uh, I think I signed in 2016, uh, I think it was. Pretty sure off the top of my head, but it was sort of early on um, in the Super Rugby season, I think. Uh, yeah, so like it's, when it first happened, like it was, um, 
it was it was a lot to do with I, I, at the time i didn't want to like once i sat on it for a couple of months i was like I, I shouldn't have signed this contract but when i signed it the old lady was actually crook and like, i was like she was sick with um some cancer and i lost the plot like i was pretty much on autopilot for probably a month like um the this the highlanders didn't even know the only person that knew was the doctor and i didn't actually know that the the coaches didn't know so um, I went to the doctor and we were dealing with all this stuff. I was seeing a sports psych and stuff like that all behind closed doors. And I just thought naturally the coaches would know and uh, got to like a month into preseason, like the, the second half of preseason and the coaches come up and they sat me in this room and they're like, what's going on, mate? Like you are terrible. And I was like, oh, and like, I just remember I was like, like I've done some stupid shit. Like I've signed this contract. Uh, mum's crook. And they're like, what do you mean your mum's crook? I was like, oh, like, mum's got cancer and they're like oh like we didn't we didn't know this and stuff like so like once that all happened like um it's not so much that like, i loved italy once once i got there but at the time i was like i shouldn't have signed this contract so just because i wasn't in the right headspace and i hadn't really thought it through that well and the more it sat on my mind i was like i've got to get out of this like it's, it just doesn't sit well with me and um we, we tried we tried breaking the contract and we managed to knock it down to one year um but yeah like i said like once i got over there i actually loved italy but um so it wasn't so much italy as a whole it was just at the time when i signed the contract i just regretted it um yeah and uh yeah just one of those things that um i probably wish i had a bit more guidance around i sort of panicked into a this decision like i wasn't getting heaps of game time at, at the at the landers um and i just sort of thought i'd sit behind a brick wall again so that was the reason why i signed it but it just wasn't that well thought through um and just sort of first contract that got put in front of me, I signed, which probably wasn't smart. And was it a money thing that wanted made you want to go over there? Or what was it about Italy that? Um, I, I think like Italy, when I was looking at like Italy, obviously a beautiful country, but um, yeah, I think I sort of thought I hit my, like, obviously we'd um, done what we'd done with Tasman, obviously hadn't won the final, but um, gone and won a Super Rugby final. Um, and at the time, I was like, fire it. Like, this is probably where I sit in the pecking order. Like, it Sops is here. Like, I'm probably not going to get much more game time. Like, I was, didn't really want to float around to another Super Rugby team if there was an opportunity just because, like, I wasn't really copped a lot of slack about um, jumping around teams, like, when I was younger and stuff. So, I was like, the only thing for me to do now is to, to head overseas. So, that was sort of the thought process. Like, all I ever wanted, I guess, was um, to have a crack at Super Rugby and try and see how I went with minutes under my belt. And I was at that time, I just wasn't getting it. Um, and the minutes I was getting, I was going all right, but just wasn't warranting enough to knock someone like Sops off his perch, which I completely understood. So, um, and that's just the way rugby goes. Sort of time and timing's a lot of it. Um, some boys fall into a spot and they nail that timing and they pick up minutes from word go. But um, obviously running into Bodie and then Sops, probably two of the better tens of recent times that have pulled on the jersey and Super Rugby is a, uh, just part and parcel with it. So then with um, Treviso, what did you do once you um, got out of that contract for a year? Yeah, so um, so I went back, I think I went up to Tassie um, and literally just spent time with the family. Um, and then I remember we, we managed to reduce it down to a year because I actually missed the cutoff date. So if I'd have turned up, I think it was November or something, I missed the qualification for um the champions oh, i can't even but the heineken cup or whatever like i wasn't technically qualified because i wasn't in the country so treviso they're pretty good like once i explained what had gone on with mum and all that they're pretty good like they they could have been real um assholes about it and just forced me into it but they said look we'll we'll meet you halfway and we'll knock it down to a year contract and when that happened um i think hayden parker did his mcl um or, or something like that at training at highlanders and Literally a week later, I got a call from Brownie and I was back down to the Landers for, for another year. And uh, and I think that's the year, like, I remember that's... And then obviously, Sops got injured pretty early on in the season. So finally got the minutes I was looking for, obviously with a with an end date of having to go to Italy. But like being able to play that season and, and get consistent minutes, like I just felt my game, like the confidence and everything just grow. And like, that's all I was looking for at Tassie I had that like you go you get your minutes you'd have some poor games you have some shit kicking experiences like you experience but as a whole you can work your way through that because you get minutes under your belt and the bad games are few and far between but getting at the at, at Super Rugby and be able to play 
I don't know, most of the season um, starting at 10 was, yeah, it was a real confidence booster for me and um, like a year that I'm, I look pretty fondly on. Obviously, we didn't win the final or anything or, or make the final, but as a person and as a personal experience, like it was yeah, pretty good for me. And you obviously took that form straight over to Italy and started carving out up for Treviso, <laughs> am I right? <laughs> yeah, went to Italy and um, got over there and we started playing, like we had a, had a few months of, or a month or so of training before the season started. And I remember we played Munster away and I, I, I knew I was sick. Like I knew, I thought I was just homesick. I was like, like, cause everything was out of my head. Like I didn't want to be there at the start. Like I was so against, I just, for this whole year, just built up in my head that I, I didn't want to be going there. Um, not so much about Italy. Like I said, it was just, I'd given up on the whole, the whole contract in my head and went over there pretty negatively minded, like towards it all. Um, so I got over there, felt, felt like I was homesick. So I was just like, just toughen up, like just go, go train and play and I remember playing Munster and I knew I wasn't right and uh, then we played the next game and then they took random blood tests off me and I was like they're like are you feeling all right I was like nah I feel like absolute shit and they're like oh your bloods have come back and you've got glandular fever and I was like oh like I've like I've been crooked for probably five weeks and like I'd actually come to the back end of it like I'd sort of gone through the the, the worst part of it but um, so it wasn't a great start to the to, to the um, competition there but once I came right then um, I think we actually went on a bit of a winning shoot there with Treviso which was pretty cool I think we at the time I think we went on their longest winning streak which wasn't huge at the time but the small wins you know I think it was five or six or something like that so the club was uh, on a bit of a high and you could sort of you could sort of feel the club was had changed from the year before like the, the year before the club was getting hidings and you could see that year that sort of transitioned into less hidings and then now they've pushed on and um been pretty pretty consistent except for this year i think they've copped a few this year but between me leaving and and this year they've gone pretty well so it was in a building phase like once i settled in and and actually started appreciating that i was there and like enjoying the environment like it was actually really good kieran crowley was an awesome coach um i think he's a taranaki lad um yeah so like being alongside him and he was awesome like he like I remember going into the first meeting and it could have been terrible. Like I just met the guys. They knew I didn't turn up for my contract. Like I said some pretty terrible stuff. Like I had to tell Kieran on the phone that I didn't want to play for him or his club. Like I had to try and get this point across that I didn't want to go to Italy. So all this would have been repeated through the club. So in my head, I was like, I'm flying over to this place where like there's going to be absolute hate for me. And I got in there and they, they were awesome. Like I, I remember being in the meeting and they, took the piss out of me and said, oh, we've had a guy that owes about $100,000 in fines because he hasn't turned up to training for a year and everyone pissed themselves and shook my hand and and that was it. Like it was, yeah, it could have been a terrible experience, but I think they, they sort of took me in there and um, yeah, I apologised to the club and said it wasn't so much about them, but, um, but looking back, like Italy is an awesome place, like you've been there. Um, yeah, obviously um, different clubs, but yeah, Benetton was a cool experience. How did you find the lifestyle and did you get it any um any good at Italian? <laughs> I tried learning Italian. We we had it we've got a plastic Italian um in the team. His name's Seb. And, uh, so he's he plays at the Italian national team now, but um we used to go and try learn Italian. Um we were horrific. He's been there for much longer than me and he knows nothing. Um yeah, and oh yeah, my mental capacity in terms of learning new things is terrible. <laughs> so like my, my Nihongo, I probably know more Nihongo than I did in Italy, just because I've probably been in the in the grapevines here for, for a couple of years. But uh, yeah, I'm terrible at learning new things, mate. So um, I know your brother, your brother's really struggling with the language too. So um, I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> That's good stuff. And then, um, so how did the Treviso thing finish? Was it just a massive million dollar yen contract in Japan that got you out of there? Or were you always just signed for Treviso a certain amount of time? Um, no, nah, so when the stuff was going off mum and when I signed that contract, um, in all honesty, like I was actually trying. So if we did manage to um, stop the Italy contract and I went through my thought process better, like I wanted to end up in Japan um, after it all. So before I went to Italy, I knew it was just to go over there, sort of pay my dues with my contract and then hopefully transition into Japan. So the whole thing was 
um, to eventually end up in Japan, just closer to home, like especially when mum was sick. So mum was still sick when I was in Italy, but the flight was just huge. Like I remember I came back for Joe Wheeler's wedding and it took like a day and a half to get back and um, just a huge effort to get back. So with mum being sick, like Japan was just the, the easiest place to be um, being out, like having the access to get home. So only a 10 hour flight before COVID, obviously without um, isolation. But so that was the whole process around it was like, if mum did get really sick that I could uh, just nip home at the drop of a hat. So, um, but Japan's awesome. Like it's uh, obviously pretty isolated. Like uh, when you were over here, you would have been here with Freebury and that, but that's the hardest thing I guess for me is coming over here without the partner, Michelle, and just going to training and sort of being on that, like I said, that auto autopilot going to training, coming home, and that that's pretty much your life until you get a day off. And uh, I'm lucky that Tojo and that are here now. We've got a decent crew of foreigners that we sort of get out and about a little bit, have a few beers and stuff like that. So it breaks up that that cycle a little bit. Um, yeah. So the plan was Michelle was going to be over here uh, after the Olympics, um, which was meant to be obviously um, what last year, last year, yeah, last year. It's all bloated by. So she was meant to be over after the Olympics. Um, but obviously with COVID that pushed it back a year so now she's obviously wanting to do the reporting at the Olympics this year so she has to stay in New Zealand so it's sort of everything's just been pushed back so in a perfect world she would have been over and um, we would have been just chipping away as a couple here but just had to take it on the chin and just accept it's the way of the world at the moment yeah and then um, obviously last year was pretty tough oh your your first year with the Red Hurricanes was obviously successful you got promoted yeah yeah beat um the poor red sparks in the promotion relegation but then last year um was obviously an extremely tough year you want to talk about both of those seasons yeah obviously the first year was when so when i signed we were still in the top league and uh i think they, the, the boys actually had their best year in the top league but the way the system worked they still had to play a playoff game and the game they probably should, was it against you guys? <laughs> it might have been. I think and somehow I think, Co- might, I think Coke had lost all their games and then they won one game yeah. at the end and survived. Yeah, so I think the boys like had their best year. Then they lost to Coke, got relegated. So I came over and sort of knew where we sat. Uh, went through the year and it was sort of our whole year was built up to literally whoever we met in the promotion game, whether it was you guys or just whoever it was. Like it, that was sort of what our whole season was based around. And so the first season was. It, it wasn't great for us because we didn't get um, really pressured too much from other teams until until we played use and then obviously transitioned into the top league. But So we sort of floated through that year and a lot of our flaws in that were hidden because we weren't playing good teams. So we sort of were in this fairy tale that our team was okay. Like, like if we get promoted here, it would be sweet. So then we played you guys. And I think we're actually pretty lucky. I think he's got a yellow card or a red card, I think from memory and I think he's had us under the pump and when he's got that we sort of got our noses in front and then got a bit of confidence and ended up winning that but which is unreal like the club like like I said like the, the people just went nuts at our club like they they thought it was the best thing ever but what we didn't realize was we'd put ourselves in a position to to go up to go up to top league um, and that was hands down like the hardest season even though it got cut short like it was only a handful of games but it was the hardest thing like I've ever sort of been a part of like our boys were trying like uh, like the boys were just they got massive hearts like they would go flat out they would train hard but we just didn't have like the systems we didn't have the personnel to compete with teams like Kobe and that like um, we went from second division to, to the top division with the second division team and like it's there's a massive gap like there's a massive gap in top league from the top teams to the bottom teams and then we were coming from further down than that so we were obviously went through that season and at the end of the season we thought oh yeah we'll we'll, we'll be right and we'd sort of played a few preseason games when we have gone okay and we thought oh yeah like the transition might not be too bad um but the way our season was structured we got met with pretty much the top three teams pretty much back to back to back and we had injuries um like our big forwards were injured. Um, like we lost Liam Squire pretty early. Like we just had smaller guys going against bigger guys with unbelievable skill. Like we're playing DC and Brody Retallick and guys like that. Like and the Japanese, like the Japanese international players were all in these top teams. So like we were just out there trying our hardest, but 
just getting absolutely torn to bits and um it, things needed to change like and it was just the personnel thing like um just needed guys that could come in and help coach the boys that are here and then obviously add some size and and stuff like even now like we're still not a big team and we've brought in like these decent sized boys um we're still going to be in relation to the top teams a pretty small team so but that year was just like 97 points is um like like i remember kobe they scored like their last try and they were rushing the kick to try to get another like another minute in to break the 100 and i was just yeah like i just felt for the boys like i was just like um yeah it was it was disheartening like because you sort of grow pretty close to the the japanese boys and like after the game and that like they were so gutted like because i was so passionate about everything they do like the, the company means everything to like the boys in the group so to see them so hurt like it was just losing was hard but then going into the changing sheet and seeing the boys like so down it was just yeah and then we next week i think we played yamaha and then we got like 70 or something like it was just like the boys it was like me in the in the highland uh when we played the highlanders like my head was gone and the moment we played kobe i think all the heads boys the boys heads just went south and we just we couldn't come back to it and we were saved by covid to be fair like yeah it was um it would have been pretty hard to get off the canvas it must have been good for your tackling practice was it that season no i think like so obviously it's 10 you spend a lot of time in the backfield so like they're just like 10 people like it was just yeah like my tackling didn't get any better like it's it highlighted it highlighted it more than anything <laughs> <laughs> oh how good what a career and I, that's that's, <laughs> that's stones and glass houses too by the way boy like i don't know how i haven't come at you like i think in my head it's just been about me but you are not the best you cannot be throwing chat like that like uh Thanks, so this is your podcast. <laughs> Come on, we're talking yeah. about you and your D. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But honestly, though, Banksy, what a career. You've played for that many teams. Uh, geez, you would have seen some sights, and you've started almost every team you've been in. You wouldn't have thought this sort of 13, 14 years ago as the skinny kid coming out of Buller that you would have played for the teams that you have and had the success that you have had. So... Um, yeah, what an awesome career. So what's what's next What's next for Big Marty Banks after this season? Yeah, I guess uh, my contract ends this year. So a lot of it depends on what happens with that. Like whether I was in Japan or whether I'm venturing back home, I'm not too sure. But I've always been pretty keen on, um, like Tassie, obviously, it's it's meant a lot Like with Buller and that. It's meant a lot to me ever since I played for Tassie. Like it was, that was probably the hardest thing about leaving New Zealand was leaving that group and, leaving that team because like like you know like being a part of that group is is pretty special like it's uh yeah like it's a real community feel and um obviously they gave me the first chance to have a crack at, at professional footy and um so for me personally like i'd love to be able to earn the chance to probably the right person to talk to at the moment earn the chance to come back and and play 50 games um but for me like if i if i get the chance to do that i like i say i want to be able to play my way into that jersey and not just hit up a coach and say, can I sneak in your back door for for a couple of games? Like, yeah, so, because um, sort of Tassie's progressed so much throughout the years, like back in the day, that's probably how it worked. You could probably flick a message and, and get a gig. But now, like the, the boys that are coming through, like the the environment and just the way Tassie's run now is just, you know, it's getting to the point where it's nearly world class. And um yeah, so like to get back into that group, it's definitely got to be earned for me. And then the other one would be obviously to play for Buller um, at some stage um, would be awesome. But outside of that, like I've got no real plans. Uh, me and Fonny had sort of speculated a tiling business there. Yeah, he um, gave it a good shout yeah. out on his podcast. He's, yeah, he's it's, talking it's, it's gone pretty. It's gone pretty quiet. He's moved back to Christchurch and um, he's fallen in love. So uh, the the phone calls are getting less and less between me and Fonz, which is a bit unfortunate. But yeah, I think if something like that happens, I think it would definitely have to be at the right time. I think like if I go back at the end of the season, then as you know, there's that transition period where you probably need a little bit of a break and Fonny's probably going through that now. But I think I'd have to clear my head a little bit if I went back and if this was the last contract, you know. So, um, but yeah, what happens, I guess the missus is obviously in Auckland. Um, we've got a house up there. So probably be rude if, rude if I didn't go back there um, after being in Japan for so long. So, um, 
yeah, we'll see what, what doors open up when I get back. True, but the body's feeling good. You, you still feel like you've got a few more years left in you? Yeah, I think so. Like, uh, like I've been in playing rugby for a while, but haven't had many minutes, Jimmy, so um, <laughs> haven't been beaten up too much yet. So yeah, I think I've still got a couple of years, but obviously that'll be uh, determined by if someone picks me up or not or if Docomo keep me on, but time will tell, mate. Man, I'm sure clubs will be racing to have you on their book, <laughs> especially after this knowing what what a lad you are but anyway <laughs> what a lad. Um, as always we've gone to our instagram for some questions oh. and as you could imagine plenty have come through you're a, you're a character that people love and um a character that people love to hear from so a lot of them is about um the same sort of stuff we've already talked about um Fonatea is always he's come up chance with the first one would you give up your super title title to kick every kick in the final versus the knacky uh he's uh, uh this is probably the part that i was dreading because i've seen this question thrown out to so many people obviously on previous podcasts and i can only imagine what's possibly come through but Fonny has um always asked me this question and it's uh it's nearly it's impossible to ask like i've always sat on the fence like i being a part of the Highlanders group and being a part of Tassie is like there's not much between them and obviously what it meant to the Dunedin to win that trophy and what it meant to the group we were a part of and what we sort of did that year and around that time was huge but then looking at the Tassie side like I could, oh, I, it's it's the hardest question probably the hardest question that Fonny has ever asked me and it's not an intellectual thing he just knows that I'm torn between the two teams and like I can't sit on one side of the fence because I can't win with the question. Um, I would say I would say I would say I wouldn't because like the experience I had by winning with the Highlanders group was massive and I still get a lot of enjoyment. Like when Tassie wins, like yeah, it was it, like brought me to tears the first one they won. Um, just seeing the boys um, win that comp. So knowing that Tassie's won their final, I'm stoked. So I can be pretty sort of content. And also, if you did kick all your goals, it doesn't guarantee that you would have won that game either. You never know what would have happened. Eh? It's, it's a funny yeah, thing about yeah, rugby. Yeah, 100%. So I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Um, does he really have Ebola? This must be from one of the Naki. Probably someone in the Naki. <laughs> no, I've only had glandular fever. Um don't think I had a bowler. I'd say Waisaki probably started that chant. Um, but yeah, he, he was into me after that final because obviously him and myself and a couple of other boys went down that year and the whole preseason was just relentless chat from him. Like, he's probably quite human, but for some reason he just gets stuck into any chance he got, he gets stuck into me. And uh, yeah, I'm just waiting for that one chance. I don't know when it'll be, but where I can get him back. Oh, you'll get him. <laughs> okay, is it true you were next in line in the Rugby World Cup 2011? This is yeah, I've heard about this. Right <laughs> next in line in 2011. Uh, I don't even think I. I think I went on the piss the night before because I just got back from Russia. I was actually in Auckland, um, but I was hung over on the final day, and I actually, I think I was on a couch just parked up watching it, so it'd have been no good. But no, nah, there's definitely no chance I'd be anywhere there. I couldn't even get off the couch to go celebrate it. I was in that. I was that dusty. <laughs> <laughs> okay what's your worst tackle attempt there's a few questions about tackling worst tackle attempt oh I've been steamrolled by Nani oh I, I still oh, that's the one thing like that's probably the one thing that Nani Nani and Seta like Nani and Snyder like, there's not much between them two to be fair but the one game at the Cape Town where He's been a four two, I think, but Nani was not he went to the fullback position. And I wasn't actually I wasn't meant to be in the I that's when you don't do reps of training. I should have been on the other side of the scrum and I think our midfield was meant to be across. And I just remember being when that scrum went down, I was like, I'm not meant to be here. And I looked up, seen Nans, and I was like, the only chance like I've got of this going pear shaped for the canes is if TJ runs this too much. But TJ just went straight from the deck. And Nans had like 10 metres between me and him. And every time I played Nans, it was just, he was coming over top of me, like straight at me. And uh, 
he obviously I waited for the steamroll, but he uh, went in and out, and then Bender got the steamroll. So I felt so bad for Bender because I remember looking back and I was just like, "Oh, I'm sorry, Bender," and I felt so shit for that since that game. But nothing like I've taken a lot of solace in the fact that Bodie went to the Blues this year, last year, and played against the Canes. And Bodie, obviously, World Player of the Year, like well above my level like obviously chalk and cheese between me and him but to see Nani do it twice in the same game to Bodhi no one can ever give me shit about it now because I can just sit and say happened to Bodhi like that that is like it's not I know it's not great great way to look at it but that's the way I'm going about it <laughs> sorry both <laughs> oh good how did you train when you were growing up what was your training <laughs> routine like how did I train? My training was I was always I was always pretty fit. Like I was, um, that was sort of my safe haven. But me and the gym had a love hate relationship. Like I can't say I got into a gym probably until the Canes. Um, and I wish I wish I, I wish I did earlier because gee I needed it. Um, but as a kid, like I just relied on other sports. Like I always sort of just relied on my fitness because I knew I wasn't big. Didn't think I could ever get big. And uh, the gym was just hard work at that age, so I always found excuses when I was younger. But, um, but now, look, I actually don't mind it. I accept it's part of part of the job, and um, put on a few kgs. I actually went over a hundred during coronavirus, <laughs> yeah, but I've dropped back down to a more happy happy space of mid nineties. So, um, but yeah, training men, men training don't really get along. Mm, fair enough. Um, was Screech off Save the Bell your first inspiration? <laughs> First inspiration, far out. That nickname, that was the county's game. And Sumo got me hooked. My eye. He just, he pretty much ruined me as a person because I've looked back, I looked exactly like Screech. My hair was exactly the same. Like, I'm sure Screech probably wore a big jersey, skinny as heck. Like, I was a dead ringer. <laughs> I'm just gutted it got announced on public TV where everyone could just sort of catch on to it. Normally, you get the odd nickname where in the team environment and it just stays in the team environment but this one was this is public and uh yeah it's still with me to this day oh bloody good do people still call you screech yeah here and there yep yep that's good stuff <laughs> eh? okay next question why does martin always smell like mud why does martin always smell like mud who's that come from lima sopawanga <laughs> oh lima sopawanga oh no because what happens is you be, what happens is if you have a bet with someone, me and Socks had a few bets at training, and you become a pig because you don't pay up on your bets. And Socks to this day still owes me a handful of bets because it was dinners, it was all sorts of stuff, and he has tried putting it on me that I'm a little pig and uh, about my previous behaviours. But yeah, it sort of it was sort of his fault because um, he didn't pay up on his bets. Shit. Okay. Marty, tell us the story how you thought you pulled off the big play with George Georgie Crawford. <laughs> Who's Georgie Crawford? <laughs> Who's that from? This is from Big Sam Casey. Oh, Sam Casey. Like I see there's like I said, there's two of you that I don't really want to pick up phone calls from. That's you and Joe Wheeler. But then there's just one person that I've just got no respect for, and that's Sam Casey. None at all. Like I've helped that guy out many times like when i was at the landers like i'd help him out went to cup day like put him up in accommodation like pretty much just held his hand a lot of times like through our friendship and then the one chance he knew where i had no idea who this girl was he just absolutely dominated me like it was like it was carnage really i was pissed off of him but i knew by the time it got to the date I knew it was a setup. Well, I felt like I knew it was a setup because Joe Wheeler was just being too coy about it all. Um, but I didn't have the guts to walk out on the date because I was like, hang on a minute, like, she's not bad. <laughs> so I was just like, let's just go to the date. But then it backfired immensely. Like, So what was there? Was there a hidden, hidden camera and stuff? Yeah, just every, like they... So I've been to Lone Star countless times. I, as you know, I don't cook much. So every Wednesday would normally every every day off would sneak down to Lone Star and get a half price feed. Um, 
but we never ever sat in the rest like we'd always sit in the restaurant you never ever get put out in the bar especially midweek because it wasn't busy enough and i remember we went in i hadn't made a booking because i'm useless like i didn't even cross my mind to ring up and book a table i was just like we'll just turn up so we'd organize the time and stuff and uh she actually chose lone star and i was like i didn't want to go to lone star because i knew the boys would be there but now i was like my 50 percent discount so i was like sweet you 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 sort of respect that side of it Gemma, oh, because you're a tight ass <laughs> but uh but but like i said like i didn't make a booking but when we got into this restaurant in the bar they're like i oh, will we'll take you in here and we're right in the middle of the bar the table was set with like two knives and forks each side like a napkin and stuff i was like why is this set because i haven't i haven't booked this like and why are we in the public bar like get me out the back so i'm a bit hidden here i was like everything was just starting to come to fruition that i knew i was in a world of hurt here and then this lady come over she took our order and then another lady came over and she wanted to take our order i was like what like why is all these people and then the owner came down because i was mates with the owner and he was like in his socks i was like why are you down here in your socks like just went on and then obviously we're sitting where they put us the security camera was right above our table just looking down straight into the table and it was just like uh, it was well planned like hats off to them like they they did bloody well but seeing joe wheeler's face and sam casey's face i just wanted to punch them square in the jaw not so much like i wasn't actually gutted about the date being a flop i was just gutted that they had got me and that was yeah that was the hardest thing to swallow have you spoken to her since yeah i think i've bumped into her every now and then and sort of have a laugh about it but you come across a lot of her mates or people in the stand and that and they're like how's georgie and I'm, obviously you just can't really respond to it because you know everyone's seen it on youtube so it's like well like, what can i say to you mate like good on you <laughs> oh classic stuff okay um best sporting event that you have ever attended as a spectator best sporting event um went to the melbourne cup there's a bit of a flop she was pissing down with rain. Um, this sporting event. I don't think I've actually been to many, to be fair. I've watched a lot of rugby games from the sideline. <laughs> I'd say the Super Rugby final. I was a spectator there for most of it. <laughs> um, um, no, I actually, I actually don't think I've been to many. I've just been to cricket and stuff, but there's nothing spectacular happened. But, yeah, I'll just go off the Super Rugby final. <laughs> Didn't you go to the um, Joseph Parker fight? Oh, yeah, went to the Joseph. No, nah, that was horrific. Like, wasn't good. Didn't enjoy that. No, nah, I went. To, yeah. AJ. Yeah, that was probably my worst experience because uh, I don't know what. That was on a Saturday, I think. But I got to Cardiff on the Friday. Who asked this question? Is this funny again? No. Uh, so, no, nah, I went to the, yeah, Joseph Parker and I got pissed all night the night before. And, oh, you were there. Yeah. And then the there. next day, I was a zombie. <laughs> like, I was in a world of hurt. Like, I wanted nothing to do with the fight. I got to the fight, knocked over some poor guys. I was walking in, like, I was pretty much asleep, kicked over some guys, drink of four beers, and it takes about 50, 50 minutes, 50 to an hour just to get the beers. Like, this poor bloke was distraught. So I had to go back up and wait the whole time for his beers. And then I just sat down pretty much with my head between my legs, just watching the rounds tick over. And then as soon... As soon as the fight finished, I was out. I didn't even, like, at the time, I was like, I don't care who wins this fight. Like, even if Joseph Parker wins this, it's still not going to get me up off the can- off the canvas. I'm still no good. Like, um, and then I heard the night out afterwards was absolutely amazing, but I didn't want a bar of it, so. Okay, next question. Um, how does Pure Sports CBD help you from Grace and Hart? Yeah, I've actually, uh, actually got some of their, their fine stuff here. Yeah, uh, actually use your discount code there, Jimmy. You're probably the one thing you've probably the one thing you've ever done for me that's been positive. Um, but no, it's actually good. Um, I've got some oil here somewhere too. Um, we've just ordered another batch, Tojo and I. So um, we're just waiting for that to turn up. But yeah, it's good stuff. I never thought, um, yeah, I'd ever take some CBD, but sort of a bit skeptical on it. But um, no, it's been awesome. Yeah, good to hear. Good to hear some good feedback. Yeah, um, bloody good. You've answered you've answered a lot of these. How did you become a goat? That's that's come up twice actually. <laughs> How did I become a goat? Yeah, no chance in hell I'm a, no chance in hell I'm a goat. Maybe I think I just got a lot of the general public's like I think people like me because I give so many people that shouldn't be their hope, you know? Like you know, like I give every person like every white battler every skinny kid out there hope that 
they can go and play sport, whatever it is. Like, definitely not a goat, but I think I've given a lot of hope to sort of people that, like, for me, I look at myself, I'm like, I shouldn't be out there. Like, there's not a chance I should be on that field, but um, just the way it's all panned out. And yeah, it's just sort of fallen that way. So I think, you know, just the, the hope of the battlers, really. You're very relatable. A lot of people can relate to you. Yeah, I'd say like you're pretty relatable too there Jabba though because like obviously I'm a better looking person than you but like we're pretty we're pretty similar in stature like our attributes are pretty similar uh, yeah, we've had so similar careers probably... as well to be fair like if you think about it we're actually you've got the curly yeah, hair and the big following but other than that like we're pretty we're pretty similar pretty similar lads yeah just I uh, don't have the amount of kids as you mate so uh, <laughs> you better start <laughs> trying work in progress but anyway, Banksy, um, that probably wraps it up there. We've been talking through your journey for some time and what a journey it's been. Um, some career, so many highs, a few lows, but um, that's all part of the game. And I've obviously loved watching you um, go through the grades. I've loved playing against you, playing with – have I played with you? Not sure if i played with no, you. No, actually, not. just on that quickly, I think the first time was uh, Southern Regions Trials. I think we were in the same team, but I was really? again on the bench and it was in the mud out the back of St. Bede. Oh, it was true. a horrific day. I don't, they put us on the yeah, backfield. It was that bad. I do bad. remember that. And I think you came off and gave me probably 10 minutes, like softs. <laughs> uh, and I think that's, that was my first interaction with you as a as a person. And oh, ever since memory. then, like, I didn't know you between then and um, then and the Canes. And uh, yeah, except for the, the time at Naki. So you've, you've grown in my book. <laughs> um, from that, from the point of not giving me any game time to Naki to to living with you, well, so I appreciate it's it. been uh, cheers for having me on, mate. It's uh, it's been good stuff, and it's uh, been less torturous than I thought. Well, that's good to hear. You are one of the lads of the game, so we had to get you on at some point, and um, it's been a pleasure chatting through your journey. So, cheers for that, Banksy. Hey, cheers, Jabba.